we first got turned on to the saltwater because we would save all of our tips throughout the summer and go down and dirt bag it on Andros or in Belize for a couple of weeks, you know, doing it as, as cheap as we could. So, you know, we get that. That's how we all started off in the world of saltwater. And, and we have a number of destinations that are designed, you know, for what I would call more basic, more rustic, but still delivering great fishing, kind of high value packages, places where you're not going to have to spend a ton, but you're still going to get great fishing. That was Jim Klug telling us what the old days were like in Belize doing the DIY thing. Belize, Permit, Yellow Dog, and much more today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Have you been getting value out of the podcast? A great way to show your support for the podcast, support local companies, and your journey is the Wet Fly Swing Member Society. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to grab some bonus resources, discounts, and go deeper with the show. In today's episode, I talk with Jim Klug, the founder of Yellow Dog Fly Fishing, one of the best-known travel companies out there. Jim talks about the diverse saltwater locations they cover, the big four and why permit are in a league of their own, and how to stack the deck in your favor on your next trip. We hear about the best time to go to police, uh, the best tip to prepare for your next trip, and, um, and the best book to read beforehand. Uh, hint, it's one of uh, it's one of Jim's books, so it, it should be good. Don't miss this one as Jim uh, describes the keys to staying safe while traveling and how to avoid getting eaten by a hippo. So, without further ado, here's Jim Klug from yellowdogflyfishing.com. How's it going, Jim? Good, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. We're we're fully in a what I'm calling our destination, kind of a destination and DIY where it works out kind of season here. So you're the perfect uh, person to get on here because you guys are leading the way in a lot of ways here. So I want to get into all the yellow dog stuff, but you know, before we jump into that, maybe we can just talk about how you first got into fly fishing and, and kind of how you got to where you are today. Well, sure, happy to, and, and thanks again for having me. Um, well, it's been an interesting journey for sure. I, uh, I grew up out in Central Oregon, started working in the fly fishing industry really when I was a kid, um, working as kind of a shop rat in one of the local fly shops there in Bend uh, when I was about 14 years old and spent a number of years doing that when I was young. And then, uh, you know, from there, I started working for one of the local steelhead guides and outfitters, uh, running gear boats and doing that for a couple of summers on the Deschutes. That evolved into several years of guiding, which took me from uh, Oregon out here to Montana, where I am now. And then, boy, from there, the path involved being a sales rep for a bunch of different fly tackle manufacturers. Uh, I worked as a sales manager at at Scientific Anglers uh, for a short period of time before starting Yellow Dog Fly Fishing Adventures uh, almost 20 years ago. We're about to hit our 20th anniversary as a, a company in the destination booking agent. So, uh, fly fishing is, uh, it's been an interesting ride for sure. Dave. Mm-hmm. That is cool. So, wow, 20 years. And I mean, have you seen over the 20 years, some big changes in the, you know, the destination type? I mean, I guess, uh, you know, you think of saltwater a lot. I mean, when you guys got, got started, what's the difference between then and now where, where things are at? That's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I would say the two things that strike me as being the most different in that, that 20 year period is one, the world has just gotten a lot smaller, right? People mm-hmm. used to look at a destination like Belize or the Bahamas as kind of super exotic and really far away. And now, you know, people start, you know, they're looking more towards places like, you know, India and mm-hmm. Kamchatka and the Seychelles and new destinations in Africa. Used, those places were, were unthinkable 20 years ago. And now that's kind of the, uh, the, the next frontier. The, uh, I would say the second big change I've seen is, is the fact that most trips used to be booked a year out. You would, you would you know, mm-hmm. make your reservations 12, 18 months in the future. Now we get calls all the time, Dave, from people that uh, will call and say, hey, I'm, I want to go to the Yucatan 
Uh, you say, oh, well, what are you thinking? They're like, well, day after tomorrow <laughs> or, you know, next Thursday. So people are, are doing stuff wow. a lot more last minute and, and they're willing to venture a lot further. And can uh, you do in, that in fish. when somebody calls up, uh, you know, I want to go, you know, ne- next week or this week? I mean, can you uh, take care of them on that? Yeah, for the most part, we can. I mean, it all boils down to availability. And most places, you know, as long as we can find availability, we can get you there and and very, you know, with very little lead time. Other places like the Seychelles, for example, or Cuba, I mean, those are the places that uh, the inventory sells out really far in advance. So someone might call and say, hey, I want to go to Alphonse in the Seychelles uh, in 2019, for example. Uh, we're like 98% sold out. Oh, wow. So it, it gets tough. It just depends on the demand on a destination and what's gotcha. still available. But, gotcha. you know, if the spaces are there, we can get people, you know, with very little lead time, we can get them taken care of. Yep. What what area has, you know, uh, Seychelles and some of those, I mean, what what is the, is there a least, you know, what what's the destination that, I mean, or first maybe before you get into that, you know, what are the destinations you guys cover? Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, are you covering pretty much anywhere anybody wants to go when you talk about destination? Do you cover it all? Yeah, you know, for the most part, we do. So we currently work in about 27 different countries, obviously including the U.S., but a large percentage of our business is outside of the U.S. So about 27 different countries with about 215 different lodge and outfitting options. Um, We're about split evenly on saltwater and freshwater. But for the most part, you know, most of these destinations where great fishing is found, we're going to cover it. Now, I will say that with the caveat, Dave, that um, we only sell what we know. So if we haven't been to a destination, if a member of the Yellow Dog team hasn't personally visited and vetted and, and done so recently, we don't sell that destination. We won't sell something that we don't know and haven't personally experienced ourselves. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a nice. big thing for, for us and for our kind of philosophy on taking care of our customers. Right on. And have you personally, I mean, what percentage of this, the locations do you try to get around to most of them or, or some of them? Or how do you work that? Yeah, you know, it is the uh, the founder of the company and, and director of operations. I've been fortunate enough to visit pretty much all of them myself mm-hmm. at, at one point in time or another. Um, obviously, I don't get to all of them every single year, but uh, someone from the team does. Um, and then I, most of them I've been to. There's a couple I haven't that I'll hopefully check off the list in the not too distant future. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Okay, yeah. so so yeah, you guys yeah. have it all covered. And, and I want to just go back before we dig in because I do want to get into some of the – you know, Belize and maybe get into a little bit on the uh, permit fishing and stuff like that, since that's a species we haven't talked about. But, you know, I want to just go back se- uh, for a second to, I think you mentioned the fly box fly shop and, and the uh, the gear boats and the sales rep. I mean, out of all the stuff you did previously, is there one job or one period that helped prepare you for, um, you know, for the stuff you're doing now? I mean, I just wonder how you got to where you are because you're kind of leading the way, but I know yeah. a lot of companies didn't make it in the destination. I'm kind of wondering what se- separates you apart. You know, it's it, the the travel agent destination booking business is tough. I mean, it really is. There's a lot of competition. And when I say that, there's a lot of people trying to do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of what I would call hobbyists out there that think, oh, it'd be so cool. You know, I'll sell travel and uh, I'll get some free trips and uh, this will be great. Um, those are the, the smaller players that typically don't survive that long and certainly don't don't bring much to the table. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta provide a real value to the customers that are booking with you. Um, you gotta not only offer great customer service, Dave, but you gotta offer technical Mm -hmm. know-how and firsthand experience. Um, you really have to make sure it's a value added experience for your customers or else heck in this day and age, people can just book it themselves. But, um, one thing that, that we really try to get across to our, our, Customers is, first of all, it doesn't cost any more to book through us than if they book direct. And and what you're getting is an agent that's really working on your behalf. But one thing that's even more important than that is that uh, we don't own the lodges that we represent and book, Dave. So mm-hmm. the nice thing about it is if people call up and say, hey, I want to go to Belize, for example. Well, we have about 15 different lodges and outfitting operations throughout the country of Belize. Oh, wow. And, and we don't have to send you to any one of those, meaning, uh, you know, our philosophy is, look, you contact us. We're not obligated to send you to one particular place. We don't have to sell one destination because we own the beds or have the exclusive 
representation agreement. To us, it doesn't matter where our clients go as long as it's the right fit for them. Hmm. And that's a really nice service to make sure that you know you can kind of cut through all the noise and the you know the glossy photos and the big promises these days and end up at a destination that really is the right fit for what you're looking for. Hmm. So I think that's a, a big part of it. But to, to your question about you know what position or what job I've, I've, I've probably had in the past that prepares you. I'd, honestly, I think for anything in this industry, really guiding mm. is, is such a great thing to do. When, when you have the ability to connect with your customers and, and you learn how to work hard for them and take really good care of them, that's going to translate to just about anything else in the fly fishing industry, certainly to, to the destination travel and customer service realm that, that we're involved in. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Cause, uh, and, and again, you guys don't necessarily have guides on your staff, but you have, I mean, and, and who is your staff? Can you talk about who the people who make up the company and then what their positions are? Yeah. Well, we have about 30 people that work here in Bozeman at, at Yellow Dog headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great team of people. Um, it's made up of uh, a number of different program managers. And the way we work this, Dave, is, is we have uh, an individual it's in charge of each particular area or country or region um, so that when someone calls, they're talking to the person that, that runs that program, the person that is knowledgeable about that area, that destination, and those fisheries. A good example is, you know, we have Sean Lawson, for example, who runs, he runs our Yucatan program. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, we've got Jake Wells and Jake runs our U S West program for us. Uh, we've got Kyle Kolajetsky. Kyle, Kyle runs uh, Argentina and Chile for us. So we've got uh, we've got a different person in charge of each area, um, and that's our sales team right there. And then we've got our admin team. We've of course got our marketing people, our mm -hmm. our web and IT people, our accounting team. But thirty people total right now working here at Yellow Dog and uh, gotcha. and, and still growing. Yeah. <laughs> And then you have all your ambassadors, like some of the people. Wow, I've probably talked to a number of them here, like uh, Yaku Lucas. Um, I don't know if Oliver mm -hmm. White. Some of those people, right? You have a big ambassador yeah. team. Yeah, we have five uh, what we call global ambassadors that are a little different than uh, some of their roles with manufacturers. Um, they, you know, Oliver and Yaku are two great examples. They've been on the Yellow Dog team for years. Um, we really rely on those guys to work with clients to answer specific questions. They host a large number of trips for us. They also spend a lot of time in those two names uh, specifically, along with like Jeff Courier. They mm -hmm. do a lot of field research for us on kind of new and up and coming and developing places. Yaku and Jeff both just got back from a, a, a couple of weeks in Cameroon, uh, for instance. So, yeah, our uh, our ambassador team is, is, is great for us as well. Those guys do a lot. Gotcha. OK, cool. And uh so yeah, I just had one, and I wanted to hit on the um, the fly box. I always love hearing a little bit of the history there. So was that the name of the fly shop you worked in? Your first yeah. shop, yeah. The, it, 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 that was in yeah. Bend. That was in Bend. Yeah. Is back that in the day. is that shop? Well, I know you. I don't think you've been to Bend recently, but is that shop still no. around? Or maybe you can explain a little bit of what that shop was like. Um, you know, it, it was an interesting shop back in the day. There were only two fly shops in Bend, and you're right. I haven't I haven't been there since I, I moved away in in the early '90s. Um, mm -hmm. So I have no idea what the, the scene is like there now. But, yeah, it was a neat shop. It used to uh, be run by a guy named Alan Stewart, who was mm -hmm. a Dartmouth guy. And uh, he hired uh, my buddy Jeff Perrin and I to you know, do all those odd jobs like sweeping the floor and bagging fly tying material mm -hmm. and counting hooks and all that. <laughs> those were those were good days. You know, we were young. We loved it. Um, yeah. Jeff how, is how still in you? Central Oregon. Oh, okay. Oh, I, got, I think we started when we were like 15 or oh, something cool. like that. Yeah. 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 So that was fun. But Jeff is still there. He owns a fly shop out in Sisters, Oregon called the Fly Fisher's Place. So. Oh, that's Jeff. And that's Jeff Perrin. Yeah. That's Jeff Perrin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. The fly box together back in the day. Yeah. Jeff reached out to me. I had a show. Um, yeah. At another show, he was, uh, we were talking about uh, maybe doing a little more on some entomology stuff. So I think I might get him on to chat about some of that. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, cool. Well, let's let's jump into a little bit on this um, on Belize, you know, because we've talked about a few of these different areas, um, and that's this is one area I haven't talked to, so uh, you know, covered yet. Can you talk a little bit about what um, you know what that's like? Like, if I was to come into you and set up that trip, what are the steps to getting that going? Like, where are the places? Well, what are the options? Yeah, so Belize is a, is an amazing country down in Central America, just south of, of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, obviously. Um, it's not a big country at all. It uh, is exactly the same size as the state of New Hampshire, to put it in perspective. But it's a country that uh, 
in my opinion, was almost like perfectly designed with the fly fishermen in mind. And they, you've got just incredible fishing from north all the way to the southern border with Guatemala, uh, that entire coastline, which is, um, you know, basically um, – lined out by the second largest barrier reef in the world. Mm. Uh, it's home to all kinds of phenomenally productive flats and offshore islands and keys, uh, you know, mangrove backwaters along the main coastline. And it's just a phenomenal destination when it comes to bonefish, permit, tarpon, and snook. It's probably one of the most diverse saltwater fisheries you can find anywhere in the Caribbean. And it's a, uh, a destination that, that always seems to deliver. Mm. Wow. Okay. So yeah, you've got everything. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, as far as permit, I mean, what's the difference between, you know, that species versus the other ones you, you talked about? Are they, I mean, are there similar tactics using, or maybe, you know, can you can explain a little bit about what it takes to get into some permit? Yeah. Well, you know, all, all the, the species, all those kind of big four saltwater flat species, the bonefish, tarpon, permit, and snook, you know, they've all got their own interesting characteristics. Um, you know, they're all great to catch on the fly. I would say the permit are almost in a little bit of a league of their own and that they tend to be more difficult and more finicky. Anybody that uh, has fished quite a bit for permit can talk to you about kind of their their arrogance and their maddening nature <laughs> and uh, <laughs> how difficult they could be. Um, but that's one of the things that makes, you know, pursuing them and, and hopefully catching them on the fly is so satisfying and so mm -hmm. rewarding. Um, they aren't easy. I mean, they're anything but. So what's a, what's a day, what's a typical day out there? I mean, you, you like, you got a chance at a fish or two sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's what you hope, you know, you, you always want to, and here's the thing about any of this saltwater fishing, you know, you always hope for the best. And when you're planning a destination or planning a trip, Dave, it always makes sense to try to stack the cards in your favor as much as you can, meaning the right time of the year, um, possibly looking at, you know, things like the moon phases and what the tides are doing. Mm -hmm certainly stacking the deck with having the right guide who's really good at what they're doing. So you try to control everything that you can't control, realizing full well that there's a lot of things that are beyond your control, weather, wind direction, you know, overcast uh, conditions mm -hmm. and visibility, um, you know, which way the winds are blowing. All of these things can really impact how the fishing is going to be. And, and it's always the case with permit fishing, right? That's a really big deal. So you, you try to stack the deck, you hope for the best. Um, and then you just go do it because unless you're out there on the water hunting for fish and, and looking for shots, you, you never know. Right. Sure. sure. Um, what, what's but you the, know, with permit fishing, yeah. I, I always say that a good way to gauge permit fishing is really, you know, to measure the number of shots and the opportunities that you get, because you know, the, the, the cast to hookup ratio on permit is, is discouraging if you look at it that way because they're tough fish on a fly. They really are. But, you know, going out and trying to get, you know, shots and opportunities is really what pursuing permit is all about. That's cool. And how long have been, I mean, it's, is this a species that, uh, you know, people have been chasing for quite a while or was it kind of like bonefish and then slowly they got into this? Or have you guys been covering this species for the, the whole, the duration? Well, what we have for our 20 years of business, we've always – kind of been addicted to permit fishing. Yeah. And so it's been a big part of our offerings. But yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look back in the early years and places like, you know, Biscayne Bay and, and Andros. What's and the early, the early what, destination. what's the early years? What do you consider? I would say like, you know, the, the mid fifties oh, and early sixties, okay. sure, like, like, like back you know, in AJ Joe McClain, Brooks, Joe, e. Brooks. Joe Brooks, some yeah. of those guys, you know, they were, they, you know, finally kind of figured out how to catch bonefish. And then I'm sure there were some instances where, you know, they thought they were, were casting at a bone or casting into a school of bones and all of a sudden they hook up on a permit. Um, but I think, you know, really kind of probably in the, the late seventies, eighties, people started dialing in on permit on the fly and, and realizing the, the challenge and thrill of that. And then from there, it's just grown in popularity for sure. Gotcha. And what is the, uh, you mentioned time of year. Is there a, what, what do you think is the best time of year to head down there for permit? Well, I mean, if you're talking Belize specifically or that area of Central America, and that would even include like the Yucatan to mm -hmm. the north, down to like the Bay Islands of Honduras, south of Belize. Um, there are two windows of opportunity that I particularly really like. One is kind of that mid-March through late May time frame. I think that can be phenomenal for, for opportunities and number of shots. And then also I really like those fall months. I like kind of the late October through late November window as well. That's a, an oft overlooked time for permit and it can be super productive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that said, Dave, those, you know, those fish live there. They're, they're 
they're always in the area and they can always be found throughout the year. So mm-hmm. you never know. But if you had to pin me down yeah. on my favorite types of fish permit, I would say that that spring window and that that window in the fall as well. Okay. And then, uh, and also on the guide, I mean, how would you recommend finding the, the right guide for the, the, the place? I mean, I guess first is picking where you want to go. I mean, how would you choose out of the 15 lodges or the places you guys covered? How do you know which one's the right one? Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, that's a big part of the, the process that we go through with every customer that books through Yellow Dog. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time asking questions. You know, what are you looking for out of a trip? Um, you know, what are your expectations? Where have you fished in the past? Um, you know, if depending on where you fish, what did you like or dislike about those trips? What is it that, uh, you know, is a priority for you? Is it, you know, catching lots of fish and having consistent action throughout the course of a day? Yeah. Or are you okay with not catching anything at all and just specifically stalking the a trophy fish gotcha. or, a, or a tough fish like permit? So it really kind of depends on, on on each client and what they're looking for, okay. Dave. It, and it yep. varies with everyone. But that's the neat thing about the process is um, – you know, we make recommendations based on gathering a lot of information on the front end from an angler, figuring out really what it is they're looking for. And also, I would say managing expectations and lining up their expectations of the right destination is is a really big part of the process as well. Okay. And and how do you, it seems like that might be a little bit of a challenge if you guys have these 15 lodges that are all great, I'm sure you know, and you kind of select the right one, but do these lodges, you know, I mean, how do you make it even, you know, you, I'm sure some lodges you don't want to leave out, right. If they're, if they don't fit the need, do all the lodges get equal coverage or how, how do you guys work that? No, not at all. And oh, okay. I'll tell you why. I mean, we've got different lodges that are, are the right fit for different types of anglers. Some we might do, you know, a small number of trips with because they are, you know, very remote or they're very rustic and basic oh, yeah. or, you know, they're only permit fishing. So, I mean, gotcha. that, coming back to permit, that's a good example. People say, oh, you know, I want to go catch a permit. Okay. You know, we've got a couple lodges down there that are hardcore permit focused lodges where that's all the guides want to focus on. But that's not right for the vast majority of anglers because people may think they want to go and, and, you know, focus yeah. only on permit. But after day three of right. not catching anything, they're like, all right, what else can I catch? Yeah. Catch no, man, you're, you're here for permit. This is what we're here for. And so, <laughs> Yeah. You know, all of those things factor in, um, and and really, at the end of the day, what we want to do is is match clients with the lodge that's best for them, and and not gotcha. worry about you know spreading things out to every lodge. So they get an equal number of bookings. We're not really concerned with no. that. We're concerned with sending people to the right I place. See. If you just look at my situation, take my example and say that I'm. I kind of like the the rustic, you know, the DIY off the cuff. Like maybe go down there, and I don't need the full all the amenities, but I'd love yeah. to maybe have a chance at a permit, but also it'd be fun to, yeah, maybe some bone, you know, whatever. I mean, when I start to talk like that, do you start to have a, a an area in mind? And can I, can you even avoid the lodge and just go down to a spot down there? Do you guys cater to that sort of thing where somebody's really trying to DIY it? So we don't do a lot of the pure DIY stuff. And I'll tell you why, um, you know, that's harder for us to control the overall experience. Oh, right. Um, and, and really that's, what we're all about is making sure that, you know, Hey, you, yeah, you want to save some money. Um, you know, what you spend on a trip is obviously a factor, but the other factor and perhaps the most valuable thing of all to each client is their time. Right. Yeah. And so we re- you know, realize that someone may, um, have one week a year to do this. Let's say that's it one week a year. Yep. And, and, you know, we want to make sure that you are at the right destination at the right time of the season that really gives you the best opportunity to have good action, that you're fishing with the right guide. You know, when it comes to DIY stuff where it's like, oh, you know, my neighbor's got a timeshare and I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. you know, find somebody that has a boat and pay him half price to take me out. Right. That That's not really going to deliver a great experience. No. And it's not something that we really want to mess around with because, yeah. again, what we're – you know, our whole focus is to provide great experiences and to you know, make sure that people are really getting the most out of both the money they're spending on a trip, but also the time they're committing to the trip as well. Yeah, no, it makes sense. So, yeah. so would there be a place that maybe you mentioned kind of the rustic, you know, would you, have yeah. a, would you have a lodge in mind where somebody might just kind of be more, a little more rustic and, you know, Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because one thing that, that, you know, we, we have in our lineup is we try to offer that full spectrum. You know, a lot of times the travel and booking agencies will 
only sell super expensive options, right? Because, you know, they want to sell higher priced, you know, trips and, mm, and make bigger oh, yeah. commissions, whatever it may be. We really try to, to offer that whole spectrum. So we certainly have the high priced ones, but we like to have everything, you know, from that really rustic, high value trip uh, and everything in between. Mm-hmm. You know, for us, because so many of us here at Yellow Dog started out as guides, you know, we, we first got turned on to the saltwater because we would save all of our tips throughout the summer and go down and dirt bag it on Andros or in Belize for a couple of weeks, you know, hmm. doing it as, as cheap as we could. So, you know, we get that. That's how we all started yeah. off in the world of saltwater. And, and we have a number of destinations that are designed, you know, for what I would call more basic, more rustic, but still delivering great fishing, kind of high value packages, places mm-hmm. where you're not going to have to spend a ton. But – you're still going to get great fishing. You're not yeah. rolling the dice with, man, I, you know, is this person a legitimate guide? Do they really know the fishery? You know, right. we have everything from that high end stuff to the, you know, more bare bones, high value, yet still very, very good fishing type packages uh, that we can offer. So we really try to have that full spectrum. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's awesome. And and you mentioned yeah. your the, the crew or back in the day when you were guiding and kind of going. I was kind of, you know, I've heard, you, you know, your name obviously has come up a number of times as I've been doing the show. And it sounds like there was kind of a, gr- a crew of people, you know, you included back. And I'm not sure if it was the, um, uh, oh, where was it out? The, T- the Tetons, right? Jackson Hole. Is that where you spent some time? Um, you know, I, I, did, not- I spent a little time yeah. in there, but it was more, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time out in Oregon and then down in Durango. I worked for Duranglers for a number of years and up here in, in Montana. But okay. when we were all getting started in the saltwater world, um, there was a, a group of us that, that ran around together for years. Almost all of those guys were still in the industry. Yeah, and you know, Ian Davis. Who's the group? Yeah, who is this group? Yeah. Well, Ian Davis, um, who used to own Breckenridge Outfitters, he's now been my, my business partner here at Yellow Dog for the last uh, 10 years. Um, there was all kinds of people in that group. Scott Harkins, who's a, a sales rep in the Rockies for Sims. Uh, we, were, we all ran around together back in the day. John Duncan, who owns Telluride Outside. Keith Parr, who's still then on Andros. Uh, okay. Of course, Andy and Benry Smith, who were guides down in Andros back in the day. But we all, you know, kind of started off down there and spent gotcha. a lot of time fixing those areas together back when we could barely afford it. <laughs> yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of, uh, yeah, I was off a little bit. I was thinking of the, um, like Tom Bai, I think, and the Drake. And there's another crew that was in the Jackson Hole, kind of some of those, uh, and maybe even Jeff Courier. I'm not sure if he was in, in that area. I think he was. But it's always interesting hearing, you know, the stories, obviously, where you guys all started. But yeah, you're, I mean, you got the good Oregon connection, which is, which is my connection as well, which is uh, definitely pretty cool. Um, well, let's see. So I want to take this a little bit, you know, I mean, if again, somebody's thinking about heading down there to Belize, what, yeah. what is, you know, planning the trip? I mean, obviously you guys cover, set everything up, but when they're planning yeah. for this trip, what would you tell them to do to get ready for it as far as being, you know, any tips on preparation, you know, yeah. whatever, what would you tell somebody? Well, I think anything, anywhere in the world of, of destination angling, that the best preparation someone can have is to practice before they arrive. And that sounds pretty remedial, but I would tell you, Dave, that probably 90% of, of traveling anglers and, and clients will take their rod out of the tube and string it up for the first time as they're preparing for their first morning already at the destination. <laughs> so the first cast they're making with that rod in maybe a year, especially right. the heavier saltwater rod, are on the bow of that boat on the first morning. And, and you know, anytime you can uh, practice ahead of time, practice your casting and, and not just the easy stuff, but practice casting into the wind, across the wind, um, practice, uh, you know, not just your distance casting, but practice your accuracy and your speed, you know? Mm-hmm. And what I mean by speed is, can you deliver a, a 40 foot cast and two false casts versus six false casts? You know, those are the things that are going to help you when you're actually down on the water with your guide and in the game. So practice ahead of time is the best preparation you can have. Gotcha. Um, another key piece of advice would be, you know, really go through your pre-trip packing list. And that's something that we um, provide with all of our, our trips and our pre-trip materials are detailed packing and equipment lists because oftentimes, and in most of the places that you're traveling to outside of the country, you're not going to have a local fly shop right there. Anything that you need, 
you're going to have to bring with you. So mm -hmm. make sure you show up with the right gear so you're not the person sitting at the lodge or at the lodge bar at the end of the day saying, oh, man, I wish I would have known to bring this or I wish mm -hmm. someone would have told me. Do your homework on the right equipment to bring. That's that's imperative. And then, um, you know, I would say making sure that uh, you're, you're fishing with the right guide. And, and that's where working with an, an agent like Yellow Dog that really knows the destination comes in. Because here's an example of that. Let's say you're going to a lodge in Belize and they have 10 guides, okay? They're all fishing the same area. Um, they're all competent. But of those 10, I guarantee you, there's two yeah. or three or maybe four that maybe are the A team, yeah. right? And then there's, you know, three or four that are pretty good. And then there's probably, you know, two or three that are, are fairly new and inexperienced. Mm -hmm. And you can be at that lodge, depending on which guide you have on that spectrum, you can have a very different experience. Yeah, so how do they choose? Sure. When, when you go to a lodge, you know, maybe it's not with you guys, but I mean, how do they mm -hmm. choose which client gets the newbies? Well, it's usually arbitrary. And sometimes, oh, okay. and you know, it, it depends on the guy too, because maybe they have less experience than some of the old guys, but we've seen lodges where the old guys are kind of going through the motions and they yeah. might be a little tired and somewhat lazy. The new kids are, are hungry and they're aggressive and they're going out there with something to prove. So it, it's much more about the individual guide than it is about, you know, tenure or how many years they've been doing it, whatever it is. Uh, it just really is knowing the difference between the guides at each of these operations. And that's one of the reasons we spend so much time at these places. Gotcha. Okay. And, yeah. and the, uh, the, the packing, list. and you guys have kind of a resource on your website. Do you guys do uh, a bunch of kind of free content there or is it mostly stuff that you kind of got to get to, you know, when to work with you guys? As far well, as, it's a, it's a yeah. combination of both for sure. But on our, we have a, a travel blog called the backstage pass and we have tons of articles on there. You can find that at yellowdogflyfishing.com, click on the backstage pass. There's okay. years and years of content, oh, great cool. articles on on recommendations and how to pack and what to pack oh, and nice. you know everything from flies to you know different line reviews, all of those things. Yep. So yeah, there's a ton of information on the Yellow Dog website. Okay, yeah, that's a good that's a good starting point just for somebody to kind of check it out. And then and then what about a rod reel line? What, what what do you recommend? Is it kind of the same for whether you're you know all the species you just kind of pick one, or are you going there with multiple setups? Well, that's a good question. Again, if we're talking about Belize specifically, yeah, um, we really do recommend that you go with multiple setups, and here's why. Um, you know, again, the thing that sets Belize apart from a lot of other countries is the diversity uh, of of different species and and the you know the access and opportunity that you have to these species. You might be out for you know a given afternoon with your guide, you're pulling down the flat looking for tailing bonefish, and all of a sudden three permit tails pop up, or you know there's a school of tarpon swimming just off the flats. If you only have one rod and you're trying to change your leader and re-rig your fly so you can get in the game with a different species, that window is closed. You're out of luck, mm -hmm. right? If you can quickly put down your bonefish rod and pick up your nine weight permit rod or, you know, a 10 or 11 weight tarpon rod, get that cast out and you're in the game, your chances of hooking up are substantially higher. So right. multiple rod reel setups Dave are really mm -hmm. helpful in, in most saltwater environments and certainly in, in Belize where, you know, you never know if you're going to come across bonefish or permit or tarpon. You just never know because they're all down there and they're all, all available. Hmm. That's great. And, and so the, for the permit, it's the, the nine foot and what, what, what sorts of lines are you using? Uh, would you recommend for that? Well, most of the time you're, you're fishing a, a, a saltwater line. Um, floating line, mm -hmm. uh, and and it's important that you have a tropical line because a lot of times people go out and spend you know seven, eight, nine hundred dollars on a new saltwater fly rod, you know a nine foot eight weight. Yep. Then they'll get their you know their brand new seven or eight hundred dollars saltwater fly reel, and then they'll say, God, you know I have that I've had that striper line for years. I've hardly used it. The things like brand new, <laughs> I'll use that. And it's a cold water line, right? Yep. You take it down to the, the tropics and the heat, and it casts like a piece of wet spaghetti. So right. you really need to make sure you have the balanced outfit. And fly line is, is crucial. Having a tropical line, almost all the time you can fish a floating line. The only time we fish an intermediate or sink tip is typically in certain tarpon situations. But for bone fishing permit, floating line, period. That's all you need down there. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of good ones out there. I personally, I, I like the scientific anglers amplitude mm -hmm. lines that they've recently come out with. Those things are amazing. By yep. far the best line I've fished in years. Nice. Yeah, yeah, they're great. That's cool. And, and yeah, we recently, I had, um, uh, well, a new company, I think you're affiliated with is, uh, the, the rent folks. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're working with those guys here at Yellow Dog for our uh, our clients that are heading off around the world, and and uh, they may not be buying uh, all new gear, but and if uh, they're looking to kind of test the waters a little bit, maybe go tarpon fishing or GT fishing or something for the first time, the the guys that rent this rod dot com can help them out. Yeah, so yeah, it's and a good little service. That is cool. So, what did you guys do before uh, before you had this? How did <laughs> you know <laughs> what did people do? You just had to get yourself a new rod. Well, and I will say this, and and this is this is huge. You know, with Yellow Dog, we don't sell retail. We never have, and and we never will. We're we're all about providing travel services and focusing on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we do have is a tremendous network of fly shops all throughout the country that we work with, Dave. Yeah. And we always, always, always recommend that our customers and the clients that book through Yellow Dog go to one of these top fly shops, support the specialty retailers right. and buy their equipment there. The fly shops are the lifeblood of this industry. Without mm-hmm. fly shops, you know, we we don't have people that can continue the education and the teaching and the retention for the sport that we need. Um so our, our mantra is always support your local fly shop and make sure it's the it's the good ones. Um, at the same time, we we understand that there are people that you know might afford their trip and they might afford one saltwater setup, but maybe the the ancillary ones like the GT rod that they may or may not fish again, they don't necessarily want to invest another fifteen hundred dollars yeah. in that. Um, before we worked with Rent This Rod, we had. Uh, a big pile of demo stuff, you know, all TNT rods and hatch reels and all this stuff in the office. And, and it became a problem because it, it was busy. And, and again, we're not in the retail business. We're not in the, the rental business. We want to focus on what we do best, which is arranging trips. And so when these guys contacted us, it was like, perfect. I know. That's exactly what we that, need. That, that's what exactly. They're actually, uh, I've been chatting with them too. They're, they're kind of, uh, we're connecting as far as kind of a little bit of a sponsorship as well. So yeah, it's they're been, great. Yeah, it was awesome. When they told me, they mentioned, I think when I chatted with them, they mentioned, you know, you guys, I was the same thing. It was like, wow, yeah, that's that's a no brainer. That's a perfect fit. So it just makes oh, sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. you know, we've got thousands and thousands of customers going all yeah. over the world every year. It's, you know, a, yeah. a percentage of them are going to need that service. So it exactly. works out well. So, uh, you know, a question that comes up quite a bit as we're, we've been doing this destination season is it's kind of a funny one, but, you know, w- what is a destination? It's been hilarious because I've talked to some people around where they've almost got angry talking about how, like, you know, what is it, you know, these destination spots? I mean, you know, what is, is a destination pretty much any spot that you kind of want to go to or what would you what would be your definition? I think a destination is any place that fishing takes you. Mm-hmm. I mean, a destination you know, for me right now, it could be over on the Gallatin River, just outside of Bozeman, you know, 10 minutes away. Destination could be all the way around the world in, you know, some remote jungle or on some remote island. I mm-hmm. mean, a destination is is where fishing takes you and, and where you find yourself when you're standing there with a rod in your hand. So, right. you know, a lot of times people try to say, well, you know, is it 500 miles or more or whatever it is? Right. It's, it could be anywhere. I mean, it could be in your own backyard. It's yeah. just the places that fishing takes you. And that's one of the... That's one of the reasons that when you when you even mention the word, it gets exciting. You know, it's like, all right, you know, people get fired up for any kind of destination fishing. It doesn't have to be out of the country. You might not need a passport. It might not even be out of your own state or your own immediate area. But it's just a, a, a place that, that fishing is going to take you and deliver you to. So. Yeah, there you go. And you guys have a few destination spots that you cover in uh, the U.S. or kind of North America? Well, I guess obviously Alaska. What, what spots do you yeah. cover around uh, the U.S., kind of the lower 48? Well, we're based right here in Bozeman, Montana. So we probably have, I'm going to say 18 or 19 different lodges right here in our home state of oh, Montana. Wow. Um, we run a, a large outfitting company right here in the Bozeman area that can get people out and everything from week-long packages to backcountry horse trips to single day trips on one of our local rivers um we do uh you know other states we have you know florida we do a lot of louisiana that's a really big destination for us washington idaho oregon um colorado all places that uh, and of course you mentioned alaska alaska is huge for us Mm -hmm. so quite a bit of domestic stuff um it's it's a growing program for Hmm. us a big part of what we do but and of course, uh, you know, uh, aside from the U.S. destinations, twenty six other countries. On top of that, wow! And, and when you guys started out, was your first? It wasn't Belize, but you were kind of. Was it South America where you guys first started? No, we started in Belize. That oh, was it our, was. Our number, there you go. Yeah, perfect. For the first two years of Yellow Dog's history, all we did was sell Belize, and and that was what we focused on. And from there, over the years, we've obviously grown and expanded. So it's yeah. been. Uh, 
Yeah, it's been great. It's been a fun ride. So when you guys started in Belize for a couple of years, I mean, how did you, I mean, what was the expansion? How did you know where to go next and how did all that come together? Well, really it was just because I was basically living down there half the year, spending a ton of time down there. And it's what, what I knew. And, uh, you know, those are the early days when, when Yellow Dog was an army of one, <laughs> or I should say two, mm-hmm. it was myself and the actual Yellow Dog at the time. But, um, you know, from there we grew and expanded and as um, we, you know, ventured into other areas and really spent time and learned those other destinations, we would add those places to the mix. You know, obviously yeah. from there we went to the Yucatan and then the Bahamas. Really the first 10 years of Yellow Dog, it was very saltwater focused. Okay. Um, but from there, as we were able to expand the team and the number of, of people working on the team here at Yellow Dog, um, we would go out and we would recruit people with certain skill sets. For example, um, John Hudgens was a great example. He ran our South America program for years before Kyle came on board. John had guided all over Chile oh, and wow. run lodges in Argentina and Chile. And those were typically the people we would look for, someone who had a lot of on-the-ground experience in an area or a region or a country that would – you know, give them the credibility to really be able to talk about it and sell it. And so that's typically how we would expand by bringing on people that had backgrounds in each area. Gotcha. And what, and what was the uh, the yellow dog name? Could you clarify that, how that all uh, came up with that? <laughs> sure. So I, I get that question a lot, yeah. actually, because it is a different kind of name for a company. But uh, back in the day, and I think I was at that time guiding down in, in Durango for uh, Duranglers. A lot of stuff on the San Juan and the Animus and we did a ton of day trips really almost throughout the year and and people would uh, come down and they would would fish with me and I always had I had a yellow lab named Bo and he would okay. go out on all the trips with us and most of the time that's you know fishing dogs are a rare yeah. thing because most of the time they're just in the way but this was a great dog he he would you know knew to sit underneath the rower seat if you were in the drift boat wow. and stay out of the way if you were doing walk wade trips he'd be right there on the bank out of the way and people were amazed and they would come back a year or two later and they, they would want to maybe fish with me again. And they couldn't always remember my name, but they always said, you know, it was the guy with the yellow dog. Oh, there you go. They always remembered the yellow dog. And nice. so when uh, I was trying to come up with a name for this company, I made a list of everything that was out there and they were all pretty similar. And when you would talk to people about where they had fished and who they had booked with, they'd say, oh, it was uh, – you know, adventures extreme or well, extreme <laughs> adventures or yeah. angling extreme. Oh, I can't remember. And, and, you know, so much similarity with those names. We wanted something that would really be different and stand out in people's minds. And so that's where the, uh, the yellow dog name came from. There you go. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect, perfect fit. Yeah. It's anything that's a little irregular. Definitely. Sticks. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Cool. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, maybe you could take, so, you know, back to Belize. So we, you know, I've ch- say we, I've chatted with you. We've set this thing up. I'm heading down there. I've got, you know, the rod basically sounds like a nine weight is, it would be a good one. Or, well, I guess you said maybe eight weight, nine weight and a 10 weight would be three good setups to bring along. Sure. Yeah. Eight, nine, 10 would be perfect for Belize. Yeah. Bonefish, permit, tarpon. There okay. you go. And then you head down there and what's, what's it look like? You know, typically I guess these things are anywhere from a, a week to up to, you know, sometimes a couple of weeks on these trips for so, folks. Well, you know, we get people that'll go down for a long weekend, Dave, for maybe mm-hmm. two or three days of fishing up to, like you said, 10, 12 days of fishing. Yeah. Uh, and the neat thing about Belize is, you know, you can cover a lot of the country in a short period of time. A lot of times if people are doing 10 or 12 days, it might be a combo trip where you start up north focusing on tarpon. And then after three or four days of that, you pop down to Punta Gorda or Hopkins or Placencia and focus more on permit, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to move around the country. It's a tiny country. Yeah. um, Very small. There's only about 365,000 people in the country uh, (laughs) and uh, really easy. So it's – Wow. Yeah, it's it, it's an easy place to access with direct flights from the U.S. into uh-huh. Belize City um, all throughout the course of every day from about 10 different major U.S. cities direct to Belize City. And then once you're there, um, you typically hop on one of the little kind of puddle jumpers for a flight of anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes to take you to your final destination. There you go. And you drop in there and then yeah. get on a little uh, uh find it are you out there on little skiffs or what or boats are you going on where how does that all go down yeah kind of depends on on where you're you're fishing but most of the time in belize you are fishing with a skiff or a ponga and then the guides are using that to access different areas um sometimes you're getting out and wade fishing Mm -hmm. other times you're fishing from the boat that's pretty common up north for example where the flats are a little softer and muddier 
Um, but it just depends, you know, wade fishing, fishing off the bow of the boat, usually a combination of the two. The boats are definitely used to access a lot of different waters and a lot of different areas. That's one of the reasons Belize uh, as a whole is not a great DIY destination mm -hmm. because it's just hard to access a lot of the fishing areas and a lot of the flats. Uh -oh. Some places like you know, certain islands in the Bahamas, no problem. You can park yeah. your car. And walk for miles and miles and miles, right? Gotcha. Belize is a little different because you've got the offshore, you know, reef where a lot of the keys and the flats are located. So just by the nature of the geography down there, you need a boat just to get to the areas where the fish are found. Mm, um, there are some exceptions to that in places like Ambergris where there's a few kind of off the beach type flats, but most of the time you uh, you need to have a boat just to access it. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. And, I'll, and I'll look up a few of these, uh, well, and links to your stuff, and I'll definitely, in the show notes, have some of this uh, information here. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it sounds like it's pretty similar, you know, whether you're talking bonefish or, you know, tarpon or these species. I mean, you, you kind of go down there, and there's going to be similar tactics as far as, you know, you know how to find fish, and, I mean, your guide's going to be kind of focusing you and get you dialed in. So, pretty straightforward. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. you know, that's the guide's job. The guide's job is to take you out deliver a good experience, put you on fish, get you in the right areas at the right times. And, uh, and you know, that's, again, that's how you make the most of your time down there. You can spend days and weeks kicking around and trying to discover stuff on your own, or you can, you know, line up a good guide and, and do it right and make the most of the time that you have in country. Gotcha. Okay. And so you guys are obviously a wealth of resource and this, maybe this is a tough question for you, but is there another, uh, any other resources you think of when you think of, uh, kind of these destination saltwater trips, if somebody's going to do them, that information that that's out there other than your own stuff? Oh yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, we just launched a new website, Dave, about a yeah, six month total rebuild on that site where there is a ton of information on the site and on the blog. So I think that's a fantastic resource, but mm -hmm. you know, any more, if you have a destination in mind or a species in mind, you know, just Googling it and finding the millions of articles and, yeah. and write-ups that are out there. There's so much information. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you did this back in the late 80s, even the early 90s, you know, you'd be looking for old faded copies of like Fly Fisherman magazine right. in order to try to find yeah. something. And now, you know, the resources are endless. There are so many websites and, and blogs and podcasts and all of these things that talk about um, – you know, different yeah. aspects of fishing, destinations, you know, specific areas, specific species. So there's a lot of great resources out there for sure. Okay. Um, and, and I will tell you this, I'll say it again. Uh, one of the all time great resources for this sport is the specialty fly shop. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you live in an area where you have a good quality fly shop, spend some time in there, get to know the guys that work in the store. Chances are good. They've fished around, they've been to different places and, and, uh, that's always a fantastic resource for anyone that's just getting into the sport or, or those that have done it for a long time and are looking to expand their horizons through traveling and destinations. Yeah, no, you're right on. I actually just recently talked to Mike Mercer out of the, uh, the Reading fly shop. Yep. And great, a, great guy. Yeah. Very I mean, that's a great example of, uh, you know, I mean, we were, I was kind of maybe thinking of talking to some saltwater stuff, but as we got into it, realized that the lower Sacramento is just such a cool, you know, river right in their in their backyard. So we ended up talking about that and. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, he he was a he's a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure a lot of the fly shops around the country have people in the shops that are just like him that have done it all. Oh yeah. So okay, cool. Yeah. What about a um, you know, as far as a book, magazine, resource, or anything that you like reading, or you know, uh, anything out there on top? Again, you know, maybe. And do you do a little? I, I'm not even sure if you've got into the whole book uh, writing game yet. Yeah, actually, I, I wrote a book um, a couple of years back called Fly Fishing Belize. Which oh, okay. is a no kidding. Huge coffee table book. There you go. 250 pages, full of information about the different regions and different areas throughout Belize. Talks a lot about the history of fly fishing in Belize, oh, the sweet. species that are found there. And that was a really fun project to work on. So mm -hmm. um, that, that book is called Fly Fishing Belize. Um, it's just about out of print. We've sold through all the copies that we did. Mm -hmm. There's still some kicking around, though. And uh, that's obviously a great resource specific mm -hmm. to Belize. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's a number of good magazines out there um, that, that talk about some of these different areas. And, uh, you know, those, those are great, good websites as well. Um, yeah. But, yeah, 
Okay. Yeah, the Belize book is a good one if you're looking specifically for information on Belize. Gotcha. And and what about, you know, obviously you've done a, a bunch of traveling over the years. Do you have any any tips on, uh, you know, if folks are out there kind of doing the travel thing, you know, making mm-hmm. things a little bit easier? Is it, uh, you know, is it, well, obviously there's more straightforward locations, but Belize sounds like it's easy. Are there any harder locations to get to? Well, you know, the cool thing about it is, is that, you know, fly fishing, has now been discovered so many areas and, and when the fishing's good, what, what tends to soon follow is infrastructure. And what I mean by infrastructure is, you know, good lodges, good guides, you know, professionals that are working those areas that really understand the sport and the species that they're pursuing. Um, so that's, that's great. Whether you're going to the Yucatan or the Bahamas, um, the Bay Islands of Honduras, Cuba, Belize, those are kind of the immediate Caribbean destinations that are so good and so productive and and also just have really, really first rate guides and great infrastructure. Um, Cuba is one that I would put kind of on the cusp of, of still being somewhat unknown because it is um, new to so many people, but uh, the fishing is phenomenal. I was just there last week hmm. again and what a place. I mean, it yeah. just delivers. It, it is one of my favorites. And it's totally that it's, it's legal right now to go down there. Is that the good question? Yeah. Good question. Um, if you book with the right entity, it is legal. Oh, no kidding. Um, you cannot just go down without, you know, jumping through some hoops and crossing T's and dot and I's. And there are a number of booking agents and entities in this, uh, U S market that are continuing to sell Cuba that are not legal to send people down there. They don't have, recognized TSP status and they, you know, haven't uh, done their work the right way to get people down there in a legal manner through the OFAC regulations. That's a big deal. Selling Cuba, you got to know what you're doing as a a traveling angler. If you're thinking about going to Cuba, make sure you do it right because there are a lot of people that'll book your trip down there that you're, you're not covered and you are not legal. So do your homework on that and make sure you're Mm -hmm. doing Cuba in a legal way or else in this day and age and with everything that's going on with the current administration, yep. there's no telling uh, what, what will happen. <laughs> right. Okay. And, uh, and I mentioned this at the start, but kind of like, uh, you know, most, uh, you know, uh, I guess the destinations that are most popular, least popular, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus sort of thing, but are there yeah. destinations out there that you kind of struggle to, to fill the vacancy for, you know, places to go to? Not, not really, but I would, I would phrase it in this way. There are destinations out there that are very niche programs that don't have a high volume of anglers every year because it's a very specific specialty type experience that's not for everybody. I would put destinations like our Masir programs in India oh. into that category, our tiger fishing operations right. in Tanzania, um, Nile Perch in Gabon. Um, these are places where they only take a handful of anglers because they have a very finite window of operation to begin with they might only operate for six or seven weeks let's say throughout the course of a year and they may only take four rods per week so you know 25 to 30 people a year fishing it very niche but also really really incredible we have a number of really exotic and kind of off the grid exciting destinations like that that don't do anything near the volume of what we might do in belize or alaska or argentina for example so uh, it's a really really cool stuff that is just a little more fringe and a little more niche and, and certainly um, best suited for a certain type of angler. Yeah. And, and there's a chance you could get eaten by a crocodile or not a crocodile, but a, a hippopotamus, right? That sort of thing. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it hasn't happened yet. So yeah. we, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know I was talking to, I think it was Jeff, yeah. I think it was Jeff, you know, Courier and we were talking about yeah. how, yeah, you gotta, be, you gotta be in a boat down there, right? Because yeah. you don't want to get in the water. Otherwise there's something that's going to probably try to eat you. Yeah, there's you got to be kind of safe when you go to these places, and that's just, you know again we've been down there. We know the guides, we know the outfitters. You know, yeah. we we know that these guys focus on safety, and and that we can comfortably send our clients to fish with these guys. That uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, that's a big thing about a lot of these off the grid areas. That and a really good global rescue medevac policy that's and right. covered. That's right. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let's uh, jump in. I got a few uh, general questions, uh, you know, as we kind of wrap sure. this thing up here. So my uh, two, two, two is, you know, the top two flies, tips and resources or, um, you know, for if we're talking about Belize and, uh, you know, and some of the species down there, if you had to pick two flies, what, what do you go with? Ooh, that's a good question. Really good question. Yeah. Um, 
you know, for permit, you got to have the right crab patterns. That's everything. Okay. Um, and Southern Belize, they, they've always really liked that Bauer crab. That's kind of a staple down there. Uh-huh. Um, and then I would say uh, also for permit down there, where, where really the flies matter because they're so finicky, okay. I would say like a, a Puglisi spawning shrimp. Yep. Um, uh, I also am a big believer in, in a uh, very realistic crab pattern that Doug McKnight ties he's an umpqua fly tire also mm-hmm. happens to be our bahamas program director here at yellow dog the guy is a, a legend fly tire and he does a, a mcknight crab that is as good as anything i've seen so oh, cool. you know bower crab mcknight crab uh puglisi spawning shrimp for permit and belize gotcha okay and when you on, on those fly patterns are you bringing different sizes uh, you know shape, yeah. all that you've, you're, it's basically just a normal deal yeah you know not just different sizes on hooks but different sink rates that's really important because you want you know maybe a size two crab or size four crab but you want one for deep water for medium water and Mm. one for really skinny water so having different sink rates as well as different sizes is really important gotcha how how deep what what is the deepest you might be fishing to these no i mean you might be you know cast into tarpon or, or schools of permit that are in you know, eight feet of water, Yeah, let's say. Um, sure. Most of the time you're not. Most of the time it's a little shallower. But, you know, even if it's five feet of water, four feet of water, you're going to want, you know, for instance, a permit crab that really dives and gets down there that's a little heavier. Yeah, gotcha. And what about, I'm not sure, you know, on the uh, kind of the uh, biology of, you know, I mean, their, their body morphology is kind of quite a bit different. Well, it's u- unique as far as permit, you know. Do you know what, what that, do you guys dig into that or talk about kind of some of the, the hi- history there? Um, compared to like bonefish, which is this very streamlined, um, I guess, is there, and is there a difference in fight? I mean, what's the difference in fight between the two? You know, it just, you know, the size really dictates that, yeah, okay. um, but you know how they eat, how you, you play them, um, how hard you can play them. Um, you know, they, they've all got similar characteristics once they're, you know, connected and you're hooked up on these fish, but yeah, I mean, how you present the fly, how they typically move on a fly, how you set the hook. Everything is a little bit different, not just with the species, but also with the with each situation. You know, what type of water you're finding these mm-hmm. fish in, things like that. So, gotcha. yeah, there's a lot to learn. Again, that's where having the right guide comes in big time. Yeah, that's huge. So, what about? And you mentioned a couple of tips. Do you have any other general tips? You know, if somebody's out there to, to help them, a couple of tips staying on this two 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 thing. Um, you know, if they're heading down to Belize. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, having. Um, the right setups and the right balanced rods, mm-hmm. reels, fly lines, make sure that, you know, everything casts well and, and feels good to you. Um, we talked earlier in the program, Dave, about practice, 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 practice. Mm-hmm. Do not wait until you get down there to, to, you know, feel how your rod works for you. Make sure you're dialed in on that. Yep. Um, accuracy and speed are two things in casting that are super important. Um, key pieces of equipment, probably number one, aside from your rod, reel, line, really balanced setup. Number one is killer prescription glasses and oh, not wow. just one, you know, talking about twos. I always have two pairs with me at all times. For instance, I like, I fish with Costas, love them. Yep. I fish the green mirror 580 G lens for kind of all around typical flat situation. And then they have what's called like a sun cloud silver mirror lens for low light situations, mm-hmm. overcast late in the day, early in the morning. I always have two pairs around my neck at all times. Oh, cool. Um, so that's really key right there. That's, um, that's one good. of the most important things you can have. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, we talked earlier, too, about having multiple rod reel setups where you've got a couple that are already rigged and set up, one for bonefish, at least one for permit, typically one for tarpon. So you can quickly pick one up and be in the game. That's huge when you're down there and on the water. Gotcha. Yeah, those are great tips. And I'll put uh, some links in the show notes again to, to some of those, the glasses and, uh, as well. And what about, yeah, um, yeah in, you know, in resources, you know, we talked a little bit about resources. Anything else you want to add if somebody's heading down, you know, heading down that way? Something that, you know, obviously you guys cover a lot of it, but any, any other things to think yeah. about in preparation? Well, one thing we always talk about with people wherever they're traveling with us in the world is, you know, be in the moment. Uh, enjoy where you are and take it all in, you know, as, as Americans, we're used to having things nicely packaged and totally controlled and very comfortable at all times. You know, when you go to a different country, you know, enjoy that country, take it all in, learn a little bit of the, of the language, experience as much of the culture as you can try new foods, listen to different music, you know, take a walk, 
outside yeah. of the you know the front porch of the lodge and, and see what's around you in the community um you know enjoy the places that, that fishing travel takes you because yeah it's it's definitely about catching fish and it's about time on the water and it's about being with friends but even more so it's about the places that it takes yeah, it you it's is. about the cultures that you experience and and uh, don't forget that i mean mm -hmm. heck otherwise you can stay home that's and, right uh, you know really really take it all in and enjoy the moment of where you are and, and be in the moment and and experience as much as you possibly can in these these amazing places that uh, that this sport takes us. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And and in those those areas, you know, say Belize, for example, if you go down there, are you able to get into the local community? Or are you kind of at a lodge? You know, or are there villages? Do you have that sort of connection as well? Well, yeah, most places you do. I mean, mm -hmm. for instance, if you're you know, fishing out of Hopkins, that's a great village to explore and walk around a small town. Um, you know, Punta Allen, Mexico is another great example. I mean, some of these small towns and areas that you, you travel through when you're fishing in Argentina or Chile. I mean, there's a lot of, of places that you can access and see uh, when you're down there. Other times you might be on a small island yeah. on a lodge by itself off the coast, or you might be on a liveaboard where that's a little bit less likely. But then, heck, if you're going down to that country, add a day or two on the front or the back to take in some non-angling activities and see some of the country in which you're visiting. Mm -hmm. That's always a great way to exactly. do it as well. Yeah, no, that's 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 it. Okay, um, and I just had one other uh, big one here, just as far as mentors. You mentioned some people. You know, you kind of were out getting going in salt. But is there any other? Are there yeah. any other mentors you've had that really helped you get to where you are today? Oh, for sure. I mean, this industry is full of good people, and and I've learned so much from from those that have kind of come before me, and those I've been lucky enough to to meet, and fish with, and work with. Uh, you know, there, there's some great ones out there. I think of, uh, you know, Brian O'Keefe, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in Bend. All Brian right. was always a guy I looked up to. He was a sales rep and <laughs> just amazing angler and a legendary photographer. I've learned a ton from Brian over the years. And he's been one of the most generous giving people I've ever come across, mm -hmm. just sharing his time and his knowledge. And, you know, he's he's supported me from the time I was a, a kid working in the fly shop back in Bend. Oh, cool. uh, he's been great. Um Definitely one of the mentors that I've had. Um, yeah. You know, there's been so many people I've looked up to, like, you know, Dave Hughes and mm -hmm. Renee Harrop and, you know, of course, the greats like Lefty. You know, you talk about somebody who was a great ambassador for the sport and for those of us that, that you know, have chosen to make this sport our profession. And we wouldn't have the opportunities we have without some of those great ambassadors that paved the way and, and really, you know, were just so good for bringing people into the sport of fishing. So. Yeah. Yeah, we're uh, we're lucky to to follow in, in footsteps of people like that. That's that for is, sure. Yeah, those are all those are all huge names. What you know, is there a time when you look back that you you know you went all in on fly fishing, or you chose it as your profession? Do you remember that 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 was that a kind of turning point in your life? You know, I, I again, it's, you know, my first job was in the fly fishing industry when I was fourteen, yeah. fifteen years old. So, so you something know, I've always done. Did but, you know right then? No, no, it was just something I always loved to do. I, I think probably the biggest turning point was when I, I graduated from college and I had been guiding during the summers, um, most recently before graduation in Montana. And I thought, you know, I'm going to come back to Bozeman. I'm going to do another year or two of guiding and then I'm going to figure out, you know, what my occupation is going to be. Am I going to go to law school? You know, what, <laughs> what am I going to do for, for the, my real job? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, heck, that was 30 years ago when there I was still working in the industry. So, so that was cool. probably the point where it's like, all right, this is now going to be my profession. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's led to, to what I'm doing now. And it's been a great ride. That's yeah. for sure. Any, um, any, I know a lot of the people that listen to this show, you know, there's definitely a chunk of people that, that want to, you know, follow in your footsteps or do some cool stuff. I mean, any tips for them if they want to get into the fly fishing, you know, space? Fish and guide. Yeah. You know, no, get out and, and, uh, you know, really learn the sport and learn the places the fishing can take you. Um, and if you want to get, um, you know, if, if you want doors to open for you in this industry, the best thing you can have on your resume, especially when you're young and starting out is guide experience. So I always tell people, it's like, learn to guide, go to a guide school, mm -hmm. get a job. Um, Alaska, probably one of the best That's places right. to start off because it's a, you know, Alaska looks for a lot of guides every summer and you don't have to be seasoned and super knowledgeable to get hired up there. So, um, you know, guide, get that in your resume and then go from there. But, uh, I will say, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, be careful. 
you know, people who say, oh, I'd love to, you know, make a, a profession out of what I love. Yep. And it, it's great. You know, I've been very fortunate and I love what I do. But, um, you know, there is a difference between, you know, the passion that is your hobby and something that's kind of your escape. And then when you make that your profession, that kind of changes the conversation a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that's always something to think about as well. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's great advice. Okay. Well, we're, mm-hmm. we're wrapping this thing up here pretty quick. I just did, I want to check. Um, I've been asking a couple of random questions here. I'm curious, did you uh, have any um, any sports that you uh, played back throughout, throughout your life? Yeah. You know, I grew up skiing okay. um, and, and now I still love skiing. It's one of my favorite things. My kids all ski race and oh, we're nice. at that age where we're, that consumes a lot of our time every year uh-huh. and, and they're very into it. Uh, now I grew up playing football um, through high school and into college. Oh, cool. um, and that was uh, something that causes my knees to hurt every day now <laughs> as I'm right. getting older. But, uh, you know, and then of course, just being outside, bird hunting, fishing, yeah. um, backpacking, you know, those are the things that always really got me excited right. was cool. anything that took me outside and, and away from people and kind of into the wild. So that was always the, the best. Cool. Cool. And your favorite, yeah. uh, your favorite beverage when you get off the river? <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's a good one yeah, um, yeah just I'm, I'm pretty partial to pretty partial to guinness so oh I'll cool drink just about any yeah any uh any beer that uh go. isn't some like a pretentious uh over uh too fruity produced or i should say over complicated like a micro beer i'm not a big fan of like the blueberry hefeweizen and yeah rutabaga oh, right. stout kind of stuff yeah. i'll take a uh, you know, a, a cold CL smooth or a PBR any day. I'm there happy with that. There you go. All right. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, Jim. Well, I think I, I'm going to let you get out of here. Uh, but before I do anything in the next six to 12 months, anything we can expect from you or Yellow Dog coming up here? Well, you know, we just launched a new website at Yellow Dog, um, flyfishing.com. We're really excited about that. That was literally turned on about four days ago. Mm. Uh, it's still a lot coming down uh, with that project. Um, we'll see what comes up from Confluence Films. Um, oh, you know, yeah. We've done, uh, I think, five movies to date, and uh, we're talking about some new ideas for the coming year. And then uh, got another book project that uh, I'm about halfway through right now. Oh, so nice. quite a few irons in the fire yep. and uh, you know, some new projects that will uh, it'll be dropping hopefully in the next 12 months. So excited about that. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Confluence Films. I, I had that as a note. I, I didn't... Uh, yeah didn't touch on maybe maybe next time if i can get you on we'll chat more about the uh, yeah. everything you have going no there but I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to everything you have there and, and the, the great film so um okay so yeah yellow yeah, dog fly fishing.com and uh but jim we just want to thank you you know for coming on appreciate you sharing some uh <laughs> some tips here and some resources i mean obviously your your website and what you guys have going is, is a great one so I'll, I'll make sure people can find you and uh, we'll go from there well great dave thanks for having me and uh I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. All right, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. All right. See ya. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash dog. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to find out how to support local companies, this podcast, and your, uh, your journey at one convenient location. Also, uh, please click on subscribe and leave a comment to let me know how I'm doing with the podcast. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up soon and hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 